Welcome to Lesson 2 of The Role of Priests in the Kingdom of the Divine Will. We are on Part 1, Who is Louisa? Subsection 2, Biographical Notes on Louisa. There is a footnote here that reads, Louisa Picaretta, A Collection of Memories by Father Bernardino Giuseppe Bucci, OFM, and a website is given which can be found on luisapicaretta.me under Biographies and Information about Luisa Picaretta by Father Bucci slash A Collection of Memories. That is not the correct address, but I'm sure you can search it and find it if you look at www.luisapicaretta.me. So the Biographical Notes on Luisa, Subsection 2, by Father Bernardino Giuseppe Pucci, OFM, co-founder with Sister Assunta Marigliano of the Association of the Divine Will. Father Pucci spent many years as spiritual advisor of the Association, which was canonically erected on March 4, 1987, in Corato, Italy, where Luisa lived and a member of the Tribunal for the Cause for Beatification of the Servant of God, Luisa Picaretta. The Servant of God, Luisa Picaretta, was born in Corrado in the province of Bari on April 23, 1865, and died there in the odor of sanctity on March 4, 1947. Louisa had the good fortune to be born into one of those patriarchal families that still survive in our realm of Puglia and like to live deep in the country, peopling our farmhouses. Her parents, Vito Nicola and Rosa Tarantino, had five children, Maria, Raquele, Filomena, Luisa, and Angela. Maria Raquele and Filomena married. Angela, commonly called Angelina, remained single and looked after her sister until she died. Luisa was born on the Sunday after Easter, parentheses, in Albis, close parentheses, and was baptized that same day. Her father, a few hours after her birth, wrapped her in a blanket, and carried her to the parish church, where holy baptism was administered to her. Nicola Picaretta was a worker on a farm belonging to the Mastrorigi family, located at the middle of Via delle Murge, in a neighborhood called Torre di Sperata, 27 kilometers from Corrado. Those who know these places, set among the sunny, bare, and stony hills, can appreciate the solemnity of the silence that envelops them. Louisa spent many years of her childhood and adolescence on this farm. In front of the old house, the impressive centuries-old mulberry tree still stands, with the great hollow in its trunk where Louisa used to hide when she was little in order to pray, far from prying eyes. It was in this lonely, sunny place that Louisa's divine adventure began that was to lead her down the paths of suffering and holiness. Indeed, it was in this very place that she came to suffer unspeakably from the attacks of the devil who at times even tormented her physically. Luisa, to be rid of this suffering, turned ceaselessly to prayer, addressing in particular the Virgin Most Holy, who comforted her by her presence. Divine Providence led the little girl down paths so mysterious that she knew no joys other than God and His grace. One day, in fact, the Lord said to her, Listen, I went around the earth over and over again. I looked at all creatures, one by one, 
in order to find the littlest of all. Among many, I found you, the littlest of all. I liked your littleness, and I chose you. I entrusted you to my angels, so that they might keep you, not to make you great, but to preserve your littleness. And now I want to begin the great work of the fulfillment of my will. Nor shall you feel greater because of this. On the contrary, my will shall make you smaller, and you shall continue to be the little daughter of your Jesus, the little daughter of my will. There's a footnote here that says this is from Volume 12, March 23rd, 1921. When she was nine, Louisa received Jesus in the Eucharist for the first time and holy confirmation, and from that moment learned to remain for hours praying before the Blessed Sacrament. When she was eleven, she wanted to enroll in the Association of the Daughters of Mary, flourishing at the time, in the Church of San Giuseppe. Also at the age of eleven, Louisa became a Dominican tertiary, taking the name of Sister Madalena. She was one of the first to enroll in the Third Order that her parish priest was promoting. Louisa's devotion to the Mother of God was to develop into a profound Marian spirituality, a prelude to what she would one day write about Our Lady. Jesus' voice led Louisa to detachment from herself and from everyone. At the age of twelve, from the balcony of her house in Via Nazario Sauro, she had a vision of Jesus suffering under the weight of the cross, who raised his eyes to her, saying, O soul, help me. There's a footnote after Via Nazario Sauro, and that reads, for the close of the diocesan phase of Luisa's cause, Corato City Council decided to change the street name from Via Nazaria Sauro to Via Luisa Picaretta. We continue. From that moment, an insatiable longing to suffer for Jesus and for the salvation of souls was enkindled in Louisa. So began those physical sufferings that, in addition to her spiritual and moral sufferings, reached the point of heroism. The family mistook these phenomena for sickness and sought medical help. But all the doctors consulted were perplexed at such an unusual clinical case. Louisa was subject to a state of corpse-like rigidity, although she showed signs of life, and no treatment could relieve her of this unspeakable torment. When all the resources of science had been exhausted, her family turned to their last hope, priests. An Augustinian priest, Father Cosma, Leodice, at home because of the Sicardian laws, the anti-clerical laws, was summoned to her bedside. To the wonder of all present, the sign of the cross that this priest made over the poor body of Louisa sufficed to restore her normal faculties instantly to the sick girl. After Father Leodici had left for his friary, Certain secular priests were called in who restored Louisa to normality with the sign of the cross. Louisa was convinced that all priests were holy, but one day the Lord told her, 
not because they are all holy. Indeed, if they only were, but simply because they are the continuation of my priesthood in the world. You must always submit to their priestly authority. Never oppose them, whether they are good or bad. Throughout her life, Louisa was to be submissive to priestly authority. This was to be one of the greatest sources of her suffering. Her daily need for the priestly authority, in order to return to her usual tasks, was her deepest mortification. In the beginning, she suffered the most humiliating misunderstandings on the part of the priests themselves, who considered her a lunatic, filled with exalted ideas, who simply wanted to attract attention. Once they left her in that state for more than twenty days. Louisa, having accepted the role of victim, came to experience a most peculiar condition. Every morning she found herself rigid, immobile, huddled up in bed, and no one was able to stretch her out, to raise her arms or move her head or legs. As we know, it required the presence of a priest, who by blessing her with the sign of the cross, dispelled that corpse-like rigidity and enabled her to return to her usual tasks of lace-making. She was a unique case in that her confessors were never spiritual directors, a task that our Lord wanted to keep for himself. Jesus made her hear his voice directly, training her, correcting her, reprimanding her if necessary, and gradually leading her to the loftiest peaks of perfection. Louisa was wisely instructed and prepared during many years to receive the gift of the divine will. The Archbishop at that time, Giuseppe de Bianchi d'Otula, December 22, 1848 through September 22, 1892, came to know of what was happening in Corotto. Having heard the opinion of several priests, he wished to exercise his authority and assume responsibility for this case. After mature reflection, he thought it right to delegate to Luisa a special confessor, Father Michele de Benedictis, a splendid figure of a priest, to whom she opened every nook and cranny of her soul. Father Michele, a prudent priest with holy ways, imposed limits on her suffering and instructed her to do nothing without his permission. Indeed, it was Father Michele who ordered her to eat at least once a day, even if she immediately threw up everything she had swallowed. There is a footnote here, footnote four, that says, if, when forced to eat by a family member, she brings it all back up again just a few minutes later. Louisa's family should be noticing that something unusual is happening. The food she brings back up is whole, fresh, and fragrant. But the people around her seem to have a spiritual blindness. They are not able to take a leap into seeing something miraculous. This quote is from The Son of My Will, Luisa Picoretta by Maria Rosaria del Genio. Copyright Libreria Edirici Vaticana. Published by the Vatican Library. Page 46. Luisa was to live on the divine will alone. It was under this priest that she received permission to stay in bed all the time as a victim of expiation. This was in 1888. Louisa remained nailed to her bed of pain, 
sitting there for another 59 years until her death. It should be noted that until that time, although she had accepted her state as a victim, she had only occasionally stayed in bed, since obedience had never permitted her to stay in bed all the time. However, from New Year's Eve 1888, she was to remain there permanently. There is a footnote here. Footnote 5 says, What makes her, Louisa's situation, stand out is the fact that if there is no blessing from the priest, she remains rigid as stone. What happens between her and the Lord become known only to her confessor. This is found in The Son of My Will, Luisa Picaretta, by Maria Rosaria del Genio, copyright Libreria Edirici Vaticana, published by the Vatican Library, page 74. In 1898, the new prelate, Archbishop Tommaso de Stefano, March 24, 1898 through May 13, 1906, delegated as her new confessor, Father Gennaro di Gennaro, who carried out this task for 24 years. The new confessor, glimpsing the marvels that the Lord was working in this soul, categorically ordered Luisa to put down in writing all that God's grace was working within her. None of the excuses made by the servant of God to avoid obeying her confessor in this were to any avail. Not even her scant literary education could excuse her from obedience to her confessor. Father Gennaro di Gennaro remained cold and implacable, although he knew that the poor woman had only been to elementary school. Thus, on February 28, 1899, she began to write her diary, of which there are 36 large volumes. The last chapter was written on December 28, 1939 the day on which the order to write ceased. Her confessor, who died on September 10, 1922, was succeeded by the canon Felice Torelli, who only assisted her for four years, because he died on January 30, 1926. Archbishop Giuseppe Leo, January 17, 1920 through January 20, 1939, delegated a young priest, Father Benedetto Calvi, as her ordinary confessor. He stayed with Luisa until she died, sharing all those sufferings and misunderstandings that beset the servant of God in the last years of her life. At the beginning of the century, our people were lucky enough to have Father, now Saint, Anibale Maria de Francia, present in Puglia. He wanted to open in Trani male and female branches of his newly founded congregation. When he heard about Luisa Picaretta, he paid her a visit, and from that time these two souls were inseparably linked by their common aims. Other famous priests also visited Luisa, such as, for example, Father Gennaro Bracali, the Jesuit, Father Eustachio Montemoro, who died in the odor of sanctity, and Father Ferdinando Cento, Apostolic Nuncio, and Cardinal of Holy Mother Church. Father Anibale became Luisa's extraordinary confessor and edited her writings that were little by little 
properly examined and approved by the ecclesiastical authorities. In about 1926, Father Anibale ordered Louisa to write a book of memoirs of her childhood and adolescence. He published various writings of Louisa's, including the book L'Orlogio della Passione, that acquired widespread fame and was reprinted four times. On October 7, 1928, when the House of the Sisters of the Congregation of Divine Zeal in Corato was ready, Louisa was taken to the convent in accordance with the wishes of Father Anibale. Father Anibale had already died in the odor of sanctity in Messina on June 1, 1927. In 1938, a tremendous storm was unleashed upon Louisa Picaretta. Three of her books were put in the index by certain priests who did not believe in her spirituality. Of the three books that were placed on the index in 1938, two of them had several other editions. The condemnation was limited only to the specific editions, editions that had been edited and changed by Don Benedetto Calvi from what Louisa originally wrote. Other editions of these same two books, The 24 Hours of the Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ and The Virgin Mary in the Kingdom of the Divine Will, have been published with full ecclesiastical approval, even as late as 1997. The third work that was put on the index, and never reprinted, was a compilation with many edited and changed extracts from volumes one through four of Louisa's writings titled In the Kingdom of the Divine Will. At the publication of the condemnation by the Holy Office, Louisa immediately submitted to the authority of the Church. A priest was sent from Rome by the ecclesiastical authorities who asked her for all her manuscripts, which Louisa handed over promptly and without a fuss. Thus, all her writings were hidden away in the secrecy of the Holy Office. The following section is within parentheses. The sovereign virtue of Louisa is obedience to God and to the magisterium of the Church. She wrote for obedience, and when the authority of the Church collected all her writings, she underwrote this declaration. Quote, if the Church considers false everything that I have written, you must consider it false. End quote. Another set of parentheses says, refer to act of submission written by Luisa Picaretta on the date October 19, 1938, and sent to Rome by Archbishop Giuseppe Leo. There is a footnote here. Footnote number six. It says, Archbishop Giovanni Piccieri, quote, the holiness of the life of the servant of God, Luisa Picaretta, end quote, Third International Congress, Madonna of Graces Sanctuary, October 27, 2005. On October 7, 1938, because of orders from above, Louisa was obliged to leave the convent and find a new place to live. She spent the last nine years of her life in a house in Via Madalena, a place that the elderly of Corato know well, and from where, on March 8, 1947, they saw her body carried out. Louisa's life was very modest. She possessed little or nothing. She lived in a rented house, cared for lovingly by her sister Angela, and a few devout women. The little she had was not even enough to pay the rent. 
To support herself, she worked diligently at making lace, earning from this the pittance she needed to keep her sister, since she herself needed neither clothes nor shoes. Her sustenance consisted of a few grams of food that were prepared for her by her assistant, Rosaria Pucci. Louisa ordered nothing, desired nothing, and instantly vomited the food she swallowed. She did not look like a person near death's door, but nor did she appear perfectly healthy. Yet she was never idle. She spent her energy either in her daily suffering or her work, and her life, for those who knew her well, was considered a continuous miracle. Her detachment from any payments that did not come from her daily work was marvelous. She firmly refused money, and the various presents offered to her on any pretext. She never accepted money for the publication of her books. Thus, one day she told Father Anibale that she wanted to give him the money from her author's royalties. Quote, I have no right to it, because what is written there is not mine. There's a footnote here. Footnote 7, it says, this is part of the Preface of the L'Orologio della Passione, Messina, 1926. She scornfully refused and returned the money that pious people sometimes sent her. Louisa's house was like a monastery, not to be entered by any curious person. She was always surrounded by a few women who lived according to her own spirituality, and by several girls who came to her house to learn lace-making. Many religious vocations emerged from this upper room. However, her work of formation was not limited to girls alone. Many young men were also sent by her to various religious institutes and to the priesthood. Her day began at about 5 a.m. when the priest came to the house to bless her and to celebrate Holy Mass. Either her confessor officiated, or some delegate of his, a privilege granted by Pope Leo XIII and confirmed by Pope St. Pius X in 1907. After Holy Mass, Louisa would remain in prayer and thanksgiving for about two hours. At about 8 a.m., she would begin her work which she continued until midday. After her frugal lunch, she would stay alone in her room in meditation. In the afternoon, after several hours of work, she would recite the Holy Rosary. In the evening, towards 8 p.m., Louisa would begin to write her diary. At about midnight, she would fall asleep. In the morning, she would be found immobile, rigid, huddled up on her bed, her head turned to the right, and the intervention of priestly authority would be necessary to recall her to her daily tasks and allow her to sit up in bed. Louisa died at the age of 81 years, 10 months, and 9 days, on March 4, 1947, after a fortnight of illness, the only one diagnosed in her life, a bad attack of pneumonia. She died at the end of the night, at the same hour. 5 a.m., when every day the priest's blessing had freed her from her state of rigidity. Archbishop Francesco Petronelli, 
May 25, 1939 through June 16, 1947, was Archbishop at the time. Louisa remained sitting up in bed. It was impossible to lay her out, and an extraordinary phenomenon. Her body never suffered rigor mortis and remained in the position in which it had always been. Hardly had the news of Louisa's death spread, then like a river in full spate, all the people streamed into her house, and police intervention was necessary to control the crowds that flocked there day and night to visit Louisa, a woman very dear to them. A voice rang out, Louisa, the saint has died. To contain all the people who were going to see her, with the permission of the civil authorities and health officials, her body was exposed for four days with no sign of corruption. Louisa did not seem dead. She was sitting up in bed, dressed in white. It was as though she were asleep, because, as has already been said, her body did not suffer rigor mortis. Indeed, without any effort, her head could be moved in all directions, her arms raised, her hands and all her fingers bent. It was even possible to lift her eyelids and see her shining eyes that had not grown dim. Everyone believed that she was still alive, immersed in a deep sleep. A council of doctors, summoned for this purpose, declared, after attentively examining the corpse, that Louisa was truly dead and that her death should be accepted as real, and not merely apparent, as everyone had imagined. There are two footnotes here, numbers 8 and number 9. Number 8 says, Father Benedetto Calvi describes what happened in the captions of some photographs in his photographic collection. Quote, her whole body did not develop rigor mortis, which happens to all human bodies right after death. People could see it every day she was viewed, before the eyes of the people of Corrado and so many people from other towns who came to Corrado just to be able to see and touch with their own hands this unique and extraordinary case, to be able to move her head in every direction with no effort at all to raise her arms, bend them, bend her hands and all the fingers. Even her eyelids could be lifted, and her eyes could be seen bright as before, without the film of death. Louisa seemed to be alive, as if she were sleeping. At this time, a group of doctors was convened just for this purpose to carefully examine the body and declare that Louisa was really dead. End quote. Source. The Son of My Will, Louisa Picaretta, by Maria Rosaria del Genio, copyright Libreria Ererici Vaticana, published by the Vatican Library, page 179. And now, footnote 9. Also in the register at the House of the Daughters of Divine Zeal, it is written, quote, With the body prepared, adorned with flowers and lights, it was exposed for public veneration, to which a great crowd hastened, even from nearby towns, in order to see one last time the saint, which was what they called her. It was the wish of her sister, Angelina, that our sisters took turns placing sacred objects on the blessed remains. 
During the three days that she was exposed, the Lord showed that this soul was not just a simple creature, but a holy victim. Her body is flexible. Everyone can see that even her blood is circulating in her veins. End quote. This from the son of my will, Luisa Picaretta, by Maria Rosaria del Genio, copyright Libreria Irarici Vaticana, published by the Vatican Library, page 180. Luisa had said that she was born upside down, and that therefore it was right that her death should be upside down in comparison with that of other creatures. She remained in a sitting position, as she had always lived, and had to be carried to the cemetery in this position, in a coffin specially made for her, with a glass front and sides, so that she could be seen by everyone, like a queen upon her throne, dressed in white, with the fiat on her breast. More than forty priests, the chapter and the local clergy took part in the funeral procession. The sisters took turns to carry her on their shoulders, and an immense crowd of citizens surrounded her. The streets were incredibly full. Even the balconies and rooftops of the houses were swarming with people so that the procession wound slowly onwards with great difficulty. The funeral rite of the little daughter of the Divine Will was celebrated in the main church by the entire chapter. All the people of Corrado followed the body to the cemetery. Everyone tried to take home a keepsake or a flower after having touched her body with it. A few years later, her remains were translated to the parish of Santa Maria Greca. On November 20, 1994, on the Feast of Christ the King, in the main church, Archbishop Carmelo Casati, MSC, in the presence of a large crowd, including foreign representatives, officially opened the cause of beatification of the servant of God, Luisa Picaretta. Here ends the lesson of the role of priests in the kingdom of divine will. Part 1. Who is Luisa? Lesson 2. Fiat.